Well, welcome everybody to podcast number five. Um, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Brian Walsh. Good afternoon, or should I say good morning, Brian? Yeah, it's morning. It's still morning here, but good afternoon to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. My introduction to Brian uh, and, uh, well, our <laughs> interaction, whether it be in person or not, for me started in uh, 2007, so way back um, in the early days of my career when I came across his um, online program, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and since then, um, I've followed a lot of Brian's work, um, any updates he's done on his programming. Um, and uh, I've also had the pleasure of uh, seeing, uh, seeing him speak at various different locations. And he's also been over to Nottingham to present a um, uh, hormonal weekend, um, uh, covering huge amounts of topics to trainers that were lucky enough to be there. Um, but before we continue, I'd like, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Brian, just giving us a little introduction as to who you are, the type of people you work with, and what area you specialize in. Sure, sure. I, think, I appreciate that. Um, and, and I have to say, uh, based on your introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm honored uh, that you wanted to, to uh, interview me. Reason being is because, you know, knowing, having known each other for the, in the degree that we have, for the length of period of time that we have, um, you are impressive. In terms of, you, you, have this, you have this voracious appetite for knowledge and information. You, you, know, you spare no expense when it comes to learning that information um, and, and trying to make yourself the, the best fitness professional you can to make your clients as successful as they possibly can. And for you to consider me to have some been played some role in that for you is uh, is, is is an honor. So I just I really appreciate uh, you you want to interview me. I just thank you. Uh, it's great, man. I appreciate it. You do you do phenomenal work, phenomenal thank work, and, and I'm not surprised at your success at all. Um, I, I simply uh, I live in America. I'm a uh, I'm a naturopathic physician. Uh, I have I've been in the fitness industry for quite a long time. Prior to going to naturopathic school, uh, got out. Uh, graduated, started seeing uh, clients and patients, and even though I was from the uh, nu the nutrition world and the fitness world, uh, I didn't uh, start. I didn't. I didn't prescribe exercise. When I was a fitness professional myself, I did. People would come in. I want to lose weight or whatever it might be. But then after naturopathic school, people would come in for menopause or migraines or they had bad skin or whatever it was, and we never uh, applied exercise as one of the first variables. What was really interesting was no matter anybody that came in for whatever reason, without doing any diet, any calorie restriction, any uh, any exercise, everybody started losing weight. And so then it began to dawn on me that your physiology, how your body works on the inside, actually dictates the results that you get from a diet and exercise program. So, you know, whether somebody is hell bent on, on kettlebells or Swiss balls, I will tell you that. It's not the exercise per se or the diet program, uh, whether it's vegetarian or paleo or a ketogenic diet. It's how your body works on the inside will actually dictate the results that you get from the diet or exercise. So um, that, that's a little bit about it. I have this, I have this like, undying passion for how the body works, and I, I cannot seem to find enough time to just constantly read and try to put pieces together of how the body works so that ultimately that can translate into healthier patients for me, but educating others uh, in terms of helping their clients as well. So. Uh, if you have any more specific questions, let me know, but that's the, the nutshell. Well, do, do, do you know what, Brian? One thing I find in this industry, fewer and fewer as the weeks go by, is people who have the level of passion that you have. And it's infectious. And, uh, you know, every time I'm around you, I get this energy of this guy just, just desperately wants to learn and learn. And every seminar I've been to you, with you, you run over. You run over by an hour or a half an hour and 
you know the thing is because you've just not finished you've just not got off your chest and, and you almost you speak with this frustration that you've still got so much to say but someone puts a time frame on you and you could oh, yeah. be there for three or four days and the yeah, thing, we can go all night oh no you yeah. can you can and, and you know I think you know I, we went for some food one night and we were sat there right to the end of the restaurant and uh, it was kind of like I think we should get some sleep and you're like oh, I'm not going to sleep I'm going to read and, and, and it's you can just see this passion and the thing is about me and the people I like to associate with is I have an immense passion for helping people change, helping trainers understand that there are alternative ways of working and um, not everybody has to be ill, not everybody has to be stressed and as a coach I know my place as to when I refer out and you know that when I've spoken to you at length in the past and we have people that we refer to especially over here as well. Um, and the reason really that, that I, I really enjoy talk, talking to you is because, you know, this is not just you working, earning, finishing, um, and having a weekend. This is 24-7 for you. This is your mind just wants to soak up. And I know whenever I'm in your presence that I, I get this, this, this energy and this, this feeling that for me, there's so much more for me to learn. And sometimes people are a closed book when you speak to them in terms of, yep, I know this and that's that. But it just opens my eyes and should open a lot of trainers' eyes to any time you come across somebody, it's not just a, a simple solution or a simple, you know, oh, it could be this. There's so much to it. So the reason, you know, one of the things about our discussion and where I want to go to today is this link between Western medicine, which is your classic in the UK NHS doctor who sits you down for 15 seconds, if that's your, your luck. Um, gives you a prescription, it's normally a medicine, normally some kind of pharmaceutical drug, and you're sent on your way. And then we have the link between um, people like the NHS, standard general practitioners, and naturopaths or functional medicine doctors, whoever it may be, who has a more uh, holistic or thought, wider thought process on, uh, on health. So first thing to you really is, could you just explain the difference between what you do and what we find, especially in the UK, um, and I'm sure in the States, when we get a very limited amount of time to speak to people um, in the medical profession, and the link between what you do and what we see commonly happening here. Yeah, no, the, the, the US is just like the, it is over there, man. It's the, the, the conventional medical system here is, is abysmal. Um, I'd say that the big difference is there's a couple of them. One is uh, if somebody has some kind of sign or symptom, and they go to a, a medical doctor, um, they get prescribed a medication to try to alleviate that sign or the symptom. And that's basically about it. Um, the, the problem is, physiologically or biochemically, there's a reason why you have a rash, or you have a migraine, or you have hormonal issues, or you have libido issues, or you, you can't lose weight despite what you're trying to do. So it's, it's very reductionistic. It's kind of myopic in the thinking. It's, honest, honestly, it's very male. If you if you want to put it that way, I mean any any guy, uh, or I should say any woman, will tell you that uh, when she has a problem, she goes to the guy, and what does the guy do? Just wants to fix it real quick and get it kind of out of the way. So so conventional medicine is very male in the sense that oh this is your problem, you have a headache here, take this. End of story. Without really getting down into the, the depths of what's going on, um, I will say I love conventional uh, medicine and Western science because they have all the money and they are the ones that are doing the studies that allow the rest of us to figure out mechanistically what's going on so we can have pieces, uh, puzzle pieces to even put together in the first place if that makes sense. So I love what they do. I love their science. In fact, medicine and Western science is brilliant in, in what they're discovering scientifically today but where they totally, and I don't I don't think you have a, a G-rated audience here, but where they completely fuck it up is they, they, they don't stand back and see where it fits into the big picture. Now, how that compares to what I do or, or sort of a more you know, naturopathic functional medicine perspective is if somebody has a sign or a symptom, that's just, that's just saying that there's something deeper going on and you have to dig deep to try to figure out where is this coming from? Why is this manifesting in this person as a migraine? Uh, it could be blood sugar. It could be nervous neurological. It could be vascular. It could be so many different things. It could be food sensitivity. It could be emotional. 
when you fix that, then you fix the problem. And you know, it, it, this example is overused, but if you have some an alarm system going on in your car, if all you do is you put earphones on or you, you muffle it, you're not getting to the problem. You have to, you have to figure out. So what we do is we try to fix the problem, find the problem, and fix the problem, rather than just kind of cover it up temporarily. Um, and that requires, and this speaks to what you were saying, is is putting all these pieces together as much as possible. So, you know, uh, we like to separate, even even in what we do, we talk about the endocrine system. All right, well, what is the endocrine system? And, and we talked about this when I when I lectured out there. Um, you know, does the heart produce any hormones? It does. So then cardiovascular system is a part of the endocrine system. You know, your skin produces vitamin D, which is a hormone. So then that's part of the endocrine system. So, you know, Western medicine has dug deep and dissected things as much as you can dissect. The problem is they haven't come back out to see how they're put together. And that's essentially, I think, what, that's the missing piece. And that's what I try to do. Brilliant. So somebody goes to the doctor and they get tested and the doctor says you have low testosterone. The doctor, okay. And the person comes back and said, yeah, he's had a really good kind of functional thought process or a holistic thought process. I have low testosterone. They're going to treat that. All right. So then we've got people thinking, well, he's thinking outside the box, but he's going to treat testosterone. So then we have the people like yourself who go, okay, so we have testosterone symptoms. So what is, what is going on around this? So we've not just got people looking at... Um, okay, we have the external symptom, somebody does a lab test, it's still not looking that extra little bit further. So then going to somebody like yourself with something, for example, like low testosterone, a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor will then look at what? Well, that's it, you know, and, and so, and, and two things in with that. One difference between conventional medicine and naturopathic medicine, or whatever you want to call it, is just simply asking a one-word question, and the question is why. You could train a monkey, no shit, to find low testosterone. It's not hard to do. You run a test, if it's below the range, it's low. Yeah. But where, where doc, conventional doctors, what they don't do is ask why. They say, oh, low testosterone, let's fix it. A, a naturopathic physician or a functional medicine doctor, they'll say, well, why? And so, um, you know, what, what you asked was, is huge. So. Um, I guess without getting into all the physiology of it, unless you want to, there are, when you look at the testosterone entire pathway, starting at the, the hypothalamus, if you want, hypothalamus, pituitary, testes, all the different hormones that have to be converted, uh, there may be 10 different ways to have low testosterone. Like one guy may overconvert to estradiol. He will have low testosterone on a lab. Guy number two uh, may have low testosterone, but he's overconverting to DHT. Both guys, same symptoms, low testosterone on a lab. Another guy, let's say uh, before that, has high androstenedione, but androstenedione is not converting to testosterone. So the low testosterone, again, low symptoms, uh, testosterone symptoms, low testosterone on a lab. But if you don't run those other hormones, you don't know why it's low. And you could even go to, to luteinizing hormone or sex hormone binding globulin. You can have somebody that has low testosterone or normal testosterone, even worse, but has all the low testosterone symptoms, but it's because he has high sex hormone binding globulin, for example. Um, so at any rate, you know, and then and then there's what I consider to be one of the biggest issues today, uh, just talking about testosterone, is how sensitive uh, the testes are to uh, stress and chemical insults and reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress. Um, you know, when when you look at when you look at really what's going on, and and, and here again. This information, I'm not making up, nor is it found in, in my field. It's found in, in Western medicine, man. Like, they're the ones that are saying, wow, look at all these chemicals that totally fuck up the ability for somebody to synthesize testosterone in the first place. But then what are they doing with this? They're not considering, they're not considering that in, in these, all these men that are having low testosterone symptoms. So that's just hormonal. So, you know, you asked where you go. You look at the hormones. You say, are they over or under converting? Or is it even being stimulated in the first place? You got to consider the, the cells that make testosterone. Do they even have the right nutrients in the first place? If they don't have the right nutrients, then why? Are they not eating it? Are they not digesting and absorbing it? Which then speaks to a digestive issue. Do they have uh, dysbiosis, too many bad bacteria, uh, causing these things called lipopolysaccharides, which will totally screw up 
the, the HPT access, or HPG, I should say, for gonadal access. So, you know, where the blood sugar, uh, if you have blood sugar dysregulation, if you have hypoglycemic uh, blood sugar fluctuations, any of these things can cause low testosterone. So coming in with low testosterone is not just, well, this is what it is, this is how you fix it. And, and I'll even say this too, in our industry, that doesn't mean, and this really bugs me, that doesn't mean giving them the testosterone boosting supplement, like Tribulus. Tribulus mechanistically works really well on one particular mechanism when it comes to low testosterone. But it's not going to help the guy that's overconverting to DHT, for example. So whether it's conventional medicine or natural medicine, many people do the same thing. They say, oh, you have low testosterone? Here's Testosterone Booster Supreme by my favorite supplement company. Take this and you'll be fine. And that's totally bullshit. It doesn't work that way. So it really means taking a step back, looking at the big picture, and finding out why this person has low testosterone in the first place, of which there could be many different reasons. So you just answered the question perfectly. The point that I was trying to get across to people, which you did very, very well, was you might think that your doctor is looking outside the box because he's run a lab test rather than making a guesstimate. That's not functional medicine or natural med naturopathic medicine. And I think a lot of people think that just because they go and see, and this is something in the UK that happens a lot, you have NHS doctors, which are obviously a government-run scheme, and then we have private doctors who are working out of their own facility, charging an hourly rate for your time. And people think that by going to see a private doctor, they're seeing somebody who thinks outside the box. They're just a NHS doctor that's gone private with the same thought process. Right. They're not a naturopathic or functional medicine doctor who's been certified in the thought process that you've just very well explained. So unless someone is sitting down and asking you that very, very important question, why, and then delving into um, more of a case history of you, then that person is very, very similar to a standard NHS doctor. Oh, completely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, no, it's not their fault. I will say this because, you know, I, I lecture sometimes at medical schools out here to the, the fourth-year students, and they're, they're taught that, that thought process, the one that you were talking about. They're not taught any other way, and so they're doing what they were trained to do. It's no different than, I don't know, someone, that, a plumber or a mechanic. They're taught a certain way. They do what they were taught. They don't know of another way. Um, so I, it's not necessarily their fault, but not not at all. I mean, if somebody's charging you more more money, spending maybe a little bit more time with you, no, absolutely not. It, it requires, and and this is why I'm never done learning, is because it requires standing back and looking at all the possible variables and factors and interactions of the entire body on why it's causing this one thing that you're observing in, in a patient. Excellent. Well. Well, the, the, the population that we kind of, um, one of the populations that we're going to be um, reaching out to on this podcast, and I'd like to start with this population, which is our day-to-day -day client. And I want to try and, with your help, broaden people's um, horizons on particular day-to-day -day issues that you see that people are blind to. So let's... I'm going to let you run wild with this, but some of the standard things that you have people come in to see you about, and they don't realize that there are um, many other things that are contributing to it, um, and when you kind of open their eyes up to the things like the, the, the stress and liver, etc., are all a big part, um, then it's then that you start to get to the root cause of the problems that, that, that's in front of you. So what are the common things that you have to really open people's eyes up to when they come and see you? You know, it's funny. In, in our industry, uh, stress is the scapegoat. Everybody blames stress for everything. That's why you're not healthy. And I'm gonna, I have kind of a different view to that. I mean, honestly, most of us are stressed. Uh, I mean, I have, I have four kids under the age of six. I don't get enough sleep. You know, I, I don't get any downtime. They they wake me up first thing in the mornings. <laughs> They're up with us at, at night. I mean, you know, money, job, relationships, uh, Ebola, like whatever the the hell it is, we're all stressed. I don't think that's the explanation. I, I that's that's the common explanation in our industry 
oh, you're so stressed, and oh, this is why you're getting sick, and all these things. Now, does stress contribute to abnormal physiology? Yes, it does. But uh, what I personally see, I think some of the top things I see, one are, are uh, gut issues. Gastrointestinal dysfunction is rampant. And, uh, you know, I, I basically say if you, know, if, you can, if you can pass gas on command, if you have to leave the room to pass gas because you know when you do it, it's going to be god-awful in its smell. Um, same if, if you have a bowel movement and it's just – and you need to use air freshener. Uh, if you have bloating – uh, if you have excessive belching, you don't need any lab test. You have gut dysfunction. That's not normal. Um, it's it, different infections. Uh, poor digestion is very, very common in a lot of people today. Uh, two are blood sugar issues, and that's a. And when I say that, most people jump automatically to, to diabetes or, or chronically elevated blood sugar or insulin resistance, but that's not the case. And I will tell you, in the fitness industry, uh, in, in fit people. They tend to have uh, hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, and these, these fluctuations of blood sugar, and that, that causes massive hormonal issues. Uh, another one you mentioned, and, and I actually don't know why, but is pretty significant liver issues. And, and to say specifically what, I can't say. Um, the liver is said to have over 300 different functions. And why is it not working well? Is it, is it, is it the chemicals and the toxins? Uh, is it nutrient deficiency? Uh, a lot of people have a subclinical fatty liver that we're just not aware of, um, but that, I will just tell you in my practice, I see a lot that if you improve liver function, a lot of things start to improve. So uh, liver stagnation, we'll just call that. Digestive dysfunction, whether it's, it's infections, whether it's uh, in some kind of inflammation, food sensitivities. Food sensitivities, uh, you can find a, you can take a condition or a symptom and look up food sensitivities and find at least one case study or maybe full-blown study on the correlations between food sensitivities and fill in the blank. Uh, it's so common to be eating things that are causing a, an immunological response to us. Um, and then the other one, and this one's obvious, and it's very downstream, is hormones. I mean, guys have too much estrogen, women have too much testosterone, um, you know, there's, there's cortisol issues, a lot of people seem to have low cortisol for some reason. Um, so I'd say those are probably some of the big ones. Uh, and then there's, there's this immune system tie-in potentially with all these things too. So gut, liver, uh, you could throw in thyroid maybe, hormones, men and women, and blood sugar issues. Um, I, you know, that's just, I mean, what's left <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. in, in terms of symptoms? And so that's really just to say that we're kind of fucked up right now. And um, but the nice thing is, is it's not hard to fix. If you, if you do the right things, if you eat the right foods, if you take the right supplements, you can turn a lot of this stuff around. So we'll, we'll get into the nitty gritty of some of the stuff in a minute. One of the things that really, really um, is very, very difficult as a trainer or a coach to help somebody with, and I'd like your um, input and advice to coaches that have to deal with this. Um, quite often it's females but we'll include men in the bracket as well. Psycholo psychology. So jumpy, irrational, anxious, emotional. And through your work and through my own developmental work, uh, through different, different study from different people, the link between your own psychology and the digestive system and inflammation and who people are when you see somebody that's blatantly not them. So you know when you, you see somebody and they're just all over the place and you, after about a month of me cleaning their diet up, maybe sorting a bit of liver function out, improving digestive health, you see a different person. Yeah. You see a more relaxed person, you Absolutely. see somebody who's sleeping better, they're remembering where they left their handbag when they went to a, to a restaurant, you know, when they used to leave it every single week. So could you uh, explain... Um, the potential link between uh, bodily or organ or cell health and brain function. Yeah, there, and then <clears throat> the thing is, it's, I will tell you as you're asking this question, I was kind of in my brain trying to construct an answer. There's actually not a clean answer for that. Um, and, and here's some examples. So just choose the system. Um, God, I mean, where do I start? So just talk about brain function. Uh, to talk about brain, you have to talk about neurons. 
Uh, neurons are, are the individual cells, essentially, that make up your entire nervous system. If a neuron doesn't have uh, steady glucose, it doesn't function properly. Classic examples, people that suffer from low blood sugar symptoms, all of their symptoms are neurological. Irritability, fatigue, uh, shakiness, uh, brain fog, those types of things. Those are all neurological. So in one of, let's, let's say again, let's say you had 10 clients, all who had a certain personality, all who worked with you for three months and are now new people. One of them may have had blood sugar dysregulation, these blood sugar fluctuations. Through diet, through exercise, you help stabilize their blood sugar. Now those neurons are getting stable glucose all the time, not getting those fluctuations, and they're having personality and mood changes. Um, similarly, you could talk about nutrients, that in order to even, you know, for these cells, not, not to get too technical, but for these cells to make ATP, you know, in, in biochemical pathways, you need some B vitamins and, and magnesium and all these things. If, if those are deficient, then again, neurons can't function properly. If neurons aren't functioning properly, then uh, personality changes can exist. Um, then you have to talk about how neurons communicate to each other. And those are, of course, with neurotransmitters. Many neurotransmitters have a, a certain amino acid precursors. So perhaps the person wasn't following a very good diet. Um, perhaps they had poor digestion. And they, didn't, and they lacked the micronutrients to convert these amino acids into the proper neurotransmitters. So let's say somebody had mood issues because they were serotonin deficient or dopamine deficient. And through working with you, you didn't actually address serotonin and dopamine, but by you know stimulating parts of the brain during exercise, but by improving their, their food intake, by improving their digestion, then they're getting all the things they need in order to make proper serotonin and dopamine. Um, I, cut me off when you're done talking about people. Fourth person, let's say they had excess inflammation um, from a variety of different sources. Uh, some of these inflammatory markers are cleared out in the liver. Or let's say somebody's exposed to toxins and chemicals or heavy metals or whatever you want to say. Let's say you get their liver working better and they're actually clearing some of these things out better. Well, that's less that's going to be impacting their brain and that person will notice personality changes. Um, I mentioned earlier lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides, just to give you a, an idea of how inflammatory these are, uh, when researchers need to uh, create inflammation in lab rats or, or rodents, they inject them with lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides come from uh, uh, unhealthy bacteria, let's just say that, in your gut. So if you have dysbiosis, if you have bad bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, they're making these lipopolysaccharides. If you have intestinal permeability, they go systemic, and then that lipopolysaccharides are absolutely uh, related to brain function and therefore personality. Uh, if somebody has food sensitivities, the immune system uh, can cause inflammation in the brain. I mean, it's, it's endless, man. Like, you, you can keep going. You can talk about astrocyte function and, and all the different ways that, that basically that something below the neck can impact the brain and therefore personality. Um, <clears throat> men and women, testosterone it's very potent at stimulating certain portions of a male's brain that gives you that male personality. Estrogen does the same thing in women. So if with working with you, you mentioned liver, but let's say you balanced out their hormones a little bit better. So that's another way for personality changes is by, by uh, modulating thyroid hormone or modulating the sex hormones, which this just goes straight back to what we were talking about at the very beginning when you asked those questions is <clears throat> What does a good practitioner do? What does a good fitness professional do? Is you take this sea of data that your clients are bringing to you. <clears throat> Medical history, uh, symptoms, signs, labs if you have them. And you take that and you look at all those things and say, okay, what am I dealing with here? So anyhow, I, I hopefully that answers your question. But in terms of personality changes and brain function, there's, there's almost – there's you'd be harder pressed to find a system in the body that didn't impact the brain somehow that did. And I know that seems like a lot of information kind of daunting, but it's not. If you do the right things, if you just, like, like you've been doing, you can see those changes without directly impacting somebody's, like you, you didn't try to change their personality. You tried to get them healthier. You tried to get them to do all the right things that you've been learning to do. And as, a, as an indirect consequence, their, person, their brain improves, and their personality improves. You see... Kind of that that explanation is absolutely fantastic, and something that I always explain to the trainers that I work with, or even coaches that come and spend time with me, 
when one of the classic things that a client will always say to us is, like, I'm signing up for 10 weeks with you. How do I stick to this afterwards? And I always say to them, trust me, after two months of working with us, you'll be a different person. And your brain will be thinking differently, and your brain will probably want to follow this program on long term. And so they're always, they're very nervous about their personality when they first come to see us because they don't trust their personality right now because their personality has let them down so much in the past with having an inability to stick to anything. And so, you know, when, when people turn around to us after 8 or 10 or 16 weeks and they say, you know, how do we improve this? How do we make me feel even better? Um, and, and this is important because... When trainers talk to me, and you've probably come across this a lot, one of the first things they say to us is, how do you get your clients to be so compliant? Well, if you're not looking uh, how to, holistically or globally at that client, then you're not giving them the opportunity to change their brain function because you're not impacting the gut, you're not impacting the liver, and you're not giving the brain a chance to heal, and the client, therefore, is going to continue being non-compliant. Correct? Right. Yeah, to some degree, I think I think the only thing I would add to this, and you and I have talked about this privately before, is you, you have to you have to figure out what that person's trigger is. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> there's two ways of looking at compliance. Um, there's one which we just discussed is is something physiologically sabotaging their willpower, sabotaging their personality and their brain, so that they're making unhealthy choices. On the other hand, is there something going on in their brain. I mean, is, is there something that's more of an emotional, you know, maybe they have a really bad relationship with their husband. Um, you know, maybe they had some, some unfortunate things happen when they were a child. Um, you know, may, and, and physiology, it's, it's not going to change those things. Um, physiology, well, I will say this. I've seen uh, women become more tolerant of their husband when they get healthier. So the husband's still a dick, but they're more tolerant <laughs> of, of their husband and, and, and aren't as stressed out by their husband, for example. So, you know, it, it's really, it's a two-way thing. It, the brain's talking to the body, the body's talking to the brain. Sometimes the brain's driving it, the, 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 the what you call the biosocial, uh, psychosocial portion is, is driving it. Other times, physiology is very much driving it. Okay. So if we have a day-to-day -day person who hasn't yet approach to coach with a who has a global thought process or hasn't approached a naturopathic or functional medicine doctor or practitioner in their area what are some of the most uh, important things from a nutritional lifestyle and psychological aspect that people can do within the next week to actually make an impact whether it's supplementation wise whether it's nutritionally wise, what are some of the, you know, if you were to say to somebody, like my top six things as a take home for an individual at home who doesn't have access to a professional that could make the biggest difference, what would they be? Yeah, well, some of them aren't very sexy, but um, physiologically, I mean, there's, there's a few things that are as important. And one's hydration. I mean, again, not sexy, I understand. But um, when you start going into the physiology of dehydration, Nothing works right. In, in fact, just, just to even give a statistic, um, so your total body water, if you look at it in a percentage, 0.5%, which is not 5%, it's less than 1% of body water loss leads to strain on the heart. And 0.5% dehydration, total body water loss, isn't enough to even initiate the thirst uh, reflex. So you're, if you're 0.5% if you've lost 0.5% of your total body water, A, you're not even feeling thirsty, but B, you've already created a strain on the heart because the, the blood's a little bit more viscous. So one is dehydration. You have to be, you have to be hydrated. And I will say, simply drinking water doesn't mean they're, they're hydrated. Uh, lab testing is, is helpful to identify that. But just to start getting people drinking more water. Um, the other, another big one, I think the biggest one is probably the elimination diet, is uh, having people remove uh, foods that are commonly sensitive to people. So uh, gluten and wheat, dairy, soy, corn, uh, there's a lot of different types of elimination diets. Generally speaking, the more restrictive they are, the better the elimination diet. So uh, you know what I find to be ineffective is say cut out dairy for a few weeks. Don't just cut out dairy, cut out everything. 
you know, have people eat some rice and vegetables and some non-antigenic meats like uh, turkey or, or some of the, some of the fowl, you know, quail or whatever. There's different diets out there. I have seen an elimination diet almost work miracles in more people I can even begin to tell you. Brain function, sleep quality, fertility issues, in as little as three weeks have, have some major, major changes. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, I think the other another big one would be to improve digestion. So hydration, elimination diet. Try to improve digestion as much as one can. It's fairly easy to do. You can give digestive enzymes. is, is fairly safe. Uh, some people recommend hydrochloric acid. Uh, I don't in, unless, uh, well, I won't get into it, but, but uh, some people can benefit from hydrochloric acid. Uh, but as a general rule, I, I wouldn't give that um, just to anybody willy-nilly. Uh, probiotics along the digestive line can be helpful. That there's a lot more research that's coming out on probiotics, some really interesting stuff. Um, and then a really good quality multivitamin, multinutrient supplement. Uh, not the one a day. You, you can't get the nutrients you need in one vitamin pill a day. It's usually going to be in the neighborhood of six a day, depending on now the, the brands that, have that, are, that are available there. And then the only other thing I would add, and there's, I mean, listen, you can talk all day about this. Some people would say, well, fish oils or omega-3s and all these different things. If it were up to me, right now I'd say hydration, elimination diet, support digestion, multi-mineral, uh, multi-vitamin supplement. And then nowadays they make powders that have just a ton of stuff in them and taste really, really good. So... Um, when I say a ton of stuff, they usually will have some like gut supportive things. They'll have liver supportive uh, compounds in them, some extra amino acids, for example. And this this is like it's like protein powder on steroids because it's going to be in a base of some kind of protein powder, uh, you know, like a rice protein or a pea protein or even a whey protein. Um, but but the, all this extra stuff in there, if you're going to be making a smoothie every day and you're going to be putting protein powder in your smoothie every day. Use one of these protein powders that have tons of other things in it, herbs and amino acids and all these things that will help support various parts of the body. So just, I mean, those those alone will take somebody pretty far. And I should say, that just goes without saying a healthy diet. You know, cutting out the processed shit, eating eating foods that doesn't have an ingredients label because it's, it's the whole food in the first place. Um, that, that goes without saying. But anyhow, so yeah, I think I think those would be some of the top recommendations. It's very interesting that you um, you talked about these drinks because what we tend to do at the beginning of working with somebody who has um, really, really needs to knuckle under and, and get their health in order pretty quickly is we alternate meal one and meal three and in between we put one of these drinks and then we go meal three and then meal four we have one of the drinks and then meal five we have a normal meal. And what we do is, if people are not in a, if people really don't want to eat more than two meals a day, then what we'll do is we'll increase the, the, the drinks, and then we'll gradually bring the drinks down to the point where they're eating whole food. Now what happens is, as you said very, very rightly, is these drinks um, are fortified with, you know, lots of nutrients to help liver detoxification. Some of them have got probiotics, they've got non-allergenic kind of rice proteins in them. Uh, lots and lots of nutrients that really give the body an optimal boost of day-to-day -day nutrients that help them function a way, way better, um, and get their health up to a up to a quicker pace. Which you know we we see a lot of people when it comes to fat loss start. Well, it doesn't happen with us, but we we hear from a lot of people they start their training and they get ill pretty quick. And this shows to me that the trainer doesn't have an appreciation for this person's inability to clear out all the metabolites and toxins. Oh, yeah. So I'd like to move on to, to kind of fat loss, if I may, and body composition, because as you know, only too well is the field that I'm um, more you know, known for. Um, and so is, my, so is my gym and the trainers that we work with. Now, we've talked about day-to-day -day people and what sort of things that they can do to improve their health. Let me ask you, what are the, some of the common things that you see co trainers and coaches do wrong when they take on a client with regard to supplementation or nutrition? I've already just mentioned the speed at which somebody tends to detoxify when there's not detoxification nutrients in place. But what are some of the things that coaches listening to this could do better when taking on a new client, especially overweight clients? Um, it's... Uh... 
I've kind of already answered that, quite frankly, because, and this, this goes back to you know, how I got started in the first place. Um, I, I mean, again, I totally respect what you do, and you're, you're brilliant at it. You're, I mean, if, if I had to lose a little weight, get competition ready, I'd come to you. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm already that lean. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you, you fucking kidding me. Not at all. Um, but no, in all honesty, I have a ton of respect for what you do and how you do it, man. I really, really do, and I, I, I absolutely would. That's a true statement. Um, but here's the thing. So, as I said before, a healthy body, healthy physiology, weight loss is easy. It's, it's, it's organic. It happens naturally. You know, I told you, when I first started my practice, we didn't. So, so think about the way a fitness professional does it. When, when somebody comes in wanting to lose weight, to change their body composition, build muscle, lose weight, lose, uh, burn, lose fat, what do they do? They change diet, and it's usually some kind of calorie restriction, macronutrient ratios, and exercise. I did it the exact opposite. I didn't do any dietary changes, uh, calorie restriction, or exercise. Rather, we would do the elimination diet, which is not a calorie restrictive diet. In fact, I would tell people, so on the elimination diet, people are restricting their foods, and it's hard. It's hard for them to give up all these foods that they've been eating. So I don't make it restrictive, and in fact, tell people, eat as much of the foods you can eat as you possibly can or want. So if you're feeling hungry, and you're feeling like eating that bagel or whatever it is, look at the foods that you can eat and just like stuff yourself silly with those. Because it's not, I'm not going for weight loss. I'm going for getting rid of food sensitivities, impacting the immune system. And guess what? People lost weight doing that. So I got weight loss. Anybody, I mean, I've had people lose, you know, 20 pounds in three weeks without doing any exercise without doing any calorie restriction, but just modifying their physiology. So to answer your question, the thing that I see fitness professionals doing wrong is not addressing physiology in the first place. And so I, I think what you're, where you're going with this question is, what are some specific things they can do? But I've already said that. Yeah, 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 if, yeah. They, if they have a blood sugar dysregulation, I will tell you that unless that's corrected, they will have a harder time losing weight. So. How do you identify that without labs? It's symptoms. You know, if people skip meals and they get irritable and, and, and uh, lightheaded between meals and shaky between meals, they have they get low blood sugar. That has to be addressed, or else fat loss is going to be harder in that person. Period. Um, and somebody whose liver is congested, they will have a harder time losing weight. Um, you know, so in any of the things we talked about, it's not just about health, and it's not just about fat loss. When's the last time you've seen somebody who was healthy who was overweight? It doesn't happen. Because healthy physiology, you don't get overweight. Maybe a little bit. But, you know, nothing that you could just cut back some calories a bit and then that would just drop the weight. We see that all the time. So to me, it's not considering physiology in the first place and just solely uh, focusing on the, the exercise program and the, the diet. And again, I'm not, again, it's how people are trained, so it's nobody's fault. But, and I'm sure you see this. So somebody, you know, Mary comes in, she's 45 years old, has three kids, she's stressed out, but she has a pretty good life. You do a certain kind of exercise program, you do a certain kind of diet, and maybe she loses a couple few pounds in about a month, but not as much as you would expect. So what do you do as a trainer? Work out harder, change the exercise variables, change the parameters in some way, change the diet, lower the, the calories, lower the carbs, raise the protein, whatever you do, but maybe it's not the diet, and maybe it's not the exercise, maybe it's your physiology in the first place. And I will tell you, having seen this countless times, if women have high testosterone, if they have any kind of hormonal imbalances, if they have low thyroid, if they have high cortisol, if they have blood sugar dysregulation, if they have a liver that's not clearing things out well, they will have a hard time losing weight. They will not get the success on your program that they would if their body was working well in the first place. So the major error that I see is this myopic view of I can get this person to lose weight just with diet and exercise. And you know what? That might work 8 out of 10 times, but there's those cases where it doesn't, and I will tell you that it's almost always physiology. So I would say it's, it's not really paying enough attention to physiology in the first place. And you know, um, you know that I work with people that compete. 
I work with people that get ready for photo shoots and also day-to-day -day people that just really want to have a really extraordinary physique um, sure. over a particular period of time. And one thing that um, really, really amazes me is people are happy to batter themselves into the ground, paying no respect to physiology. And they don't work with a coach that has a very um, broad um, thought process. Then the second time they come around to diet again, they can't get in shape. So they diet harder and they train harder and they put themselves into a deeper hole and people are developing signs and symptoms of you know, inflammatory issues or, or psychological problems in terms of levels of depression or stress. And then they choose to diet again, having not respected the body enough the second time and the first time around. And we get this vicious cycle where, again, you know, people are getting these psychological problems and levels of depression and stress, and they're not really relating it to the damage that they've put their body under. And this can be day-to-day -day clients right through to competitive people. So, so again, you know, it's this thought process, it's this data collection and it's this realization that it is not just the fact that you've got to diet harder and train harder. If it's not happening ha normally, then physiology is at stake. You know, phys phys physiology is behind a lot of the problems, which then leads us to what is your ideal test, your gold standard testing methodology that someone can do with either their practitioner, coach, experience coach, that would give you a lot more information to be able to potentially help them with where they're, where they're at right now? Uh, you cannot beat a comprehensive blood chemistry over any other test out there. And, you know, there are some amazing functional labs out there, but none of them can top what, none of them can top the information that you can get from a comprehensive blood chemistry, if, if you know what you're looking at and how to interpret it correctly. Um, most blood chemistries are not that comprehensive, I will say, both in the States and I've, I've seen some blood chemistries from the UK, uh, Canada, a variety of different places. Um, so you kind of have to push to get a really good blood chemistry and, and know what markers to, to ask for. But just to give you an example, so on a blood chemistry, you can find, you can find hypoglycemia or insulin resistance. There's actually some markers on a, on a panel, standard panel, that can give you inferences into digestive function, give you inferences into liver function, uh, can give you inferences in, well, obviously into thyroid and, and hormones. So uh, in, in hydration, I mentioned as well. So there's no other test that is as inexpensive, is as internationally respected as a test, um, that can tell you as much information as a comprehensive blood chemistry that's interpreted correctly. Uh, the second one, if you were to add another one, it's far more expensive, uh, is a urinary organic acid test. Um, it is to the functional medicine world what a blood chemistry is to, con to conventional medicine. Um, it's quite a bit more expensive, um, but if, if you could do both, awesome. If you could only do one, start with a blood chemistry every time. Awesome. Now, there is one point one, one area of health that I see so common with so many people and you know we've talked about testing we've talked about day-to-day -day people we've talked about body composition and you know this podcast really isn't for us to sit down and say you know somebody can't lose weight off their hip somebody can't lose weight off their thighs it's more in detail there's too much to it we're trying to give people a real good appreciation that there's a different way of thinking out there and that they don't need to be um, struggling to improve their health or their body composition because there's another thought process out there but something I come across more and more and more down nowadays is constipation. Yeah. And honestly, I'd say eight out of ten women that I see have constipation. Yep. And I want to use this podcast because this is actually one of the biggest problems that I see because then I see a common link with this whole psychology issue with, with, with women that have, totally. have terrible, terrible constipation. Now, what are your thoughts on constipation? What are your thoughts on potential causes of constipation and what are some real golden kind of nuggets if we could use them in terms of constipation yeah, right. um, that can help women particularly um, realize that there's a way out of this yeah that's a big one <clears throat> so um, constipation could be something as simple as dehydration first of all 
when you look at the, the function of the large intestine, its job at that point is to extract water and electrolytes. And, and there's a lot of bacteria. The bacteria make, make vitamins and such. But its job is to extract water. And so if somebody is dehydrated and the job of the large intestine was to extract water, it will extract as much water as it can because the body's dehydrated. So it's like it's trying to get water from anywhere it possibly can. So dehydration by itself is, is the classic one. Um, <clears throat> low thyroid hormone function would be another one. Uh, low, so I'll, I'll call it hypothyroidism, but low, low free T3 is essentially what it is. Uh, slows down all metabolic processes, including digestion. And low thyroid hormone is a classic, classic way to become constipated. In fact, um, I wouldn't be surprised with the prevalence of hypothyroidism in women, especially today, and constipation, that many of these women that you're referring to have some kind of thyroid hormone uh, imbalance. Again, usually low free T3, which I don't need to tell you about, but uh, that would be one of them. Um, another simple one is magnesium deficiency. That magnesium as you know, can act as a laxative. But magnesium, uh, in high dose, in high amounts, but magnesium deficiency uh, can lead to uh, constipation. Uh, a low fiber diet can do it as well. Um, I had a couple, of, I had another one I was going to tell you about, but I can't remember. Oh, <clears throat> well, this just speaks to a whole bigger thing. So you've heard of irritable bowel syndrome, yes. IBS. Uh, they have, if, if you're aware, they have an IBS. Uh, D standing for IBS. They have an IBS C. Can you just, re re IBS just can you just repeat what IBS D was? You just cut out. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's I irritable bowel syndrome hyphen D is in dog, and that D stands for diarrhea. There's a diagnosis of IBS hyphen C for cat, which stands for constipation, and then there's a diagnosis of IBS hyphen M for Mary that stands for mixed, meaning it's both. Who doesn't that cover? That's the most ridiculous uh, uh, diagnosis that you could possibly have. A woman has irritable bowel syndrome, but she's constipated. Another one has irritable bowel syndrome, but she has diarrhea. And the third one has a mixture of co a combination of di diarrhea and constipation. Well, what the fuck is left? So if you look at the different causes of IBS, there's a very strong emotional component for a lot of women that have IBS. Some kind of that I've se I've seen I've seen this written a few times, that there may be some kind of uh, I don't, who knows what it is, but like a traumatic event earlier in life, something rather that's still lingering, emotional, and it's and it's manifesting as that. Um, <clears throat> food sensitivities can cause uh, constipation, uh, infection, so dysbiosis, whether it's a yeast infection or or a parasite or bacterial infection, those can cause so. There's a lot of different things that can cause constipation in the first place. Psychologically, one thing to consider with these women is there's the phrase anal retentive. You want to see in these women that are constipated, are they anal retentive in other areas of their life? Uh, are they sort of like obsessive compulsive? Or which is to say, are they very controlling? Do they have to control their day, the, their schedule, try to... Tr control their husband or maybe they feel like they can't control their husband or parts of their life so they have to control other things and one of the things they can control is you know bowel habits and the last possible one oh, there's more um, is uh, neurological entrainment that they have <clears throat> women you know it, it's not sexy for women and, and poop and gas so you know have they trained themselves to hold it so much so that there's these neurological, uh, let's just call them motor programs for now, where they, they've they lost that connection. They, they don't have the connection between themselves and their, their bowels anymore. So <clears throat> a lot of different possibilities. Um, one of the, you asked about possibilities. What's the problem with this? The major problem is that you may be familiar with the term uh, enteropathic recirculation, that many things in our, in our colon get reabsorbed back into us. Now, that's, that's supposed to happen. Like bile gets recycled 17 times before it finally gets expelled, which is phenomenal. Water gets reabsorbed. Uh, electrolytes get reabsorbed. So it's a normal process. But you, if, if there's a normal movement of feces through the, the large intestine, 
you get a certain amount of absorption, but not too much. If stuff just stays in there, you are reabsorbing stuff that was designed to go out and can otherwise cause what's called endotoxemia. You get toxic on the inside because you're reabsorbing all this stuff from your colon, which was supposed to be leaving the body. So that's all the possibilities. That's the major problem with it. What do you do? And that goes back to what we talked about in the first place. You gotta, you gotta ask why. What's the problem? <clears throat> if they're, if they're hydrated or not. Um, I will tell you clinically. Until you figure out why, you gotta get them moving their bowels. Uh, two easy ways of doing that are either high dose vitamin C, a lot of, and, and that's going to be fairly innocuous, or high dose magnesium, or both. Um, you gotta get that stuff moving out and. You don't want them to become reliant on something like magnesium, but in the interim, until they're healthier, until they're moving things along better, you definitely want to get things moving. So. Good, good, good. And when it, <laughs> comes, when it comes down to magnesium, I have people say that I've tried, they've tried magnesium, it doesn't work, but I know there's different types of magnesium, right? So yeah. which magnesium do you see most effective for increasing bowel movement? Citrate probably would be one of the better ones. The uh, <clears throat> so just as a general rule, anytime you know, my my goal is to educate, not just to tell somebody something. Um, the less bioavailable the magnesium, the more it's going to cause that laxative effect. So if you read about magnesium glycinate, that's really bioavailable, which is why people love it because it it, it absorbs so much and you get so much absorption in your gut of that kind of magnesium. Mag citrate isn't as bioavailable, and because of that, it ends up to tend to stay in your bowels, and which tends to draw water towards it, and that's what ends up causing that laxative effect. So, if you're trying to use these super bioavailable, healthy, wonderful, more expensive magnesiums that everybody recommends, that's great for increasing magnesium in the body, but they're not going to have as strong as as potent as a as a laxative effect as, as some of the less bioavailable ones like like mag citrate for example. Uh, Epsom salts is tastes fucking horrible, but that'll get the job done too. Excellent. Well you talked about bioavailability, you talked about recirculation, and something we try and explain to our clients a lot about liver function is recirculation of toxins in the body yep. because of poor liver function. And obviously, we've got everything from digestion in the gut. We've got, the, you know, small intestines. We've got the liver. What role in improving body composition would a dysfunctional liver cause? So, again, uh, it's it's been said that the liver has over three hundred functions. The question is, if the liver's not functioning well, which of those three hundred functions could impact body composition? And it's a hell of a lot of them. So, for example, and, and I mean, I can't get into all this. One of the things the liver does is makes new glucose, gluconeogenesis, when your glucose goes low. If the liver doesn't do that very well, then you'll get these blood sugar fluctuations leading to hormonal issues and everything that we talked about downstream from that, period. That's just one. <clears throat> Two, uh, the liver is, oh man, the liver makes so many different proteins. If the liver's not working well, it doesn't make the proteins as well. These proteins uh, can have numbers of different functions in the body. Um, but then, I think speaking more to the point of what people are more interested in, is there are, so the, the liver is said to be the major detoxification organ. Nowadays, uh, Western science has made really clear that there's a number of different I hate the word toxins, but people know what I'm talking about. Different toxin, chemical, pesticide, different things that uh, if the body can't get rid of them, tends to get stored, especially in fat tissue. And sort of the, uh, and that, that can cause two things. One, and I love this concept, it's the concept of unhealthy fat cells. Now, most of us look at fat as something we don't want. And therefore we think it's all bad and it's all toxic, but that's not the case. There is such thing as, as good healthy fat and I'm not talking about having too much of it, but healthy fat makes healthy compounds. It makes anti-inflammatory compounds like adiponectin, for example. Unhealthy fat is horrible. It's, it's, fat, it's, it's fat that's even worse than we would imagine fat to be. It's pumping out all sorts of inflammatory chemicals. It doesn't 
burn fat itself very well. And so these chemicals, if they build up, can cause this lipotoxicity, cause these unhealthy fat cells that are less likely to release these chemicals. They're less likely to release their own adipose or triglycerides and therefore contribute to uh, not having a harder time losing weight. So um, to officially answer your question in, the, in a non-sexy way is to say if the liver has 300 functions, if it's not working well, how many of those relate to body composition? And it's going to be a hell of a lot of them. But in terms of uh, the liver metabolizes and clears out sex hormones. The liver metabolizes and clears out inflammatory uh, compounds. It clears out uh, uh, neurotransmitters. It clears out toxins and chemicals. So if the liver's, and it makes a bunch of shit too. So if the liver's not working well, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say you can you can kiss the, uh, you know, a, a low body fat percentage goodbye, but it's going to be a lot harder. And, and what you've just said is absolutely spot on. And this will go from a fat loss perspective to a muscle building perspective. You know, we're looking to have the body in its um, in as healthy and optimal functioning state as possible to get maximal anabol anabolism. And maximal fat loss. So, you know, when we're starting somebody off on a program, you know, trying to get them to understand that health of cells and optimal organ function and optimal hormonal function is going to result in an easier fat loss journey. And no one's going to no one's going to take away from the fact that getting to very low percentage body fat is not going to take, as I refer to, uh, having a good set of balls or a good set of minerals to go. You know, we're going to have to put the body in a state of where it doesn't want to go to. But on a day to day person level. Getting somebody to say an optimal 10% body fat shouldn't be difficult. And if it's very, very difficult, then we've got some hormonal or dysfunctional problems going on physiologically in the body. And when it comes to building muscle tissue, I, this is something I've been talking to a lot of people about recently, is this role of inflammation. And I come across a lot of people that are showing signs and symptoms of being inflamed, uh, whether or not it's skin problems such as acne or psoriasis or, um, you know, dry skin or, or, or any other kind of links to poor recovery and training and big drop off in weight and stress. And I was trying to explain to somebody the other day about kind of this fluidity or this health of cells and the healthier our cells are, the more likelihood they're in a more optimal place to grow. So what would be... Um, your interpretation or your way of delivering the uh, health of cells in terms of an inf inflammation level and ability to grow tissue repair optimally? Yeah, <clears throat> um, you should have started out ask, asking that question because that, that's a loaded answer, man. So you know my bag is cells. Like that's that's to me, that that is, we, we didn't even talk about that, but that's the major feature of all of this, man. Like. And when you understand how a cell works, I don't care if you're talking about a muscle fiber, which is a cell, and it has a nucleus, and it has mitochondria, or it's a neuron, and it has the same phospholipid membrane, and it has a mitochondria, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum. When you understand how cells work, it's not a hormonal deficiency. It's, it's because cells are making these hormones. Cells have receptors for these hormones that are being made elsewhere. And cells, this is what gets really cool, is uh, so you're talking about like building muscle. So what really is being built in muscle is you know actin and myosin filaments, which are proteins. And so what do you need in order to build more actin and myosin? You need to make sure you know there's the mTOR, the rapamycin pathway, and leucine, and all those different fancy things. But on a fundamental level, does that cell is it making enough ATP? to build that tissue because it takes energy for the nucleus and the ribosomes to take the proper amino acids and put them together in the right structure to make more actin and myosin. Does it even, is it even making enough ATP in the first place? Um, and then that speaks to this, this whole concept and, and this is, oh man, we could talk about this for a while. What's really interesting about muscle building is technically what you're doing is you're inducing inflammation. When you, when you lift weights, you know, it's not written about very much in the, in the exercise world, but really what you're doing is you are inducing a little bit of inflammation because, uh, and this is in conventional medicine, you can only heal a tissue if there was inflammation in the first place. 
we see inflammation as bad, and that's wrong. That's like saying insulin's bad. That's like saying glucose is bad, and that's wrong. If, if you have too much insulin, it's bad. If you have not enough, you're also going to die. So is insulin good or bad? It's both. Is inflammation good or bad? It's yeah, both. Yeah. Because, and this is, this, is, this is actually an area I'd really like to, to get into more. Exercise causes intentional inflammation. And again, it's, it's not written about in the exercise industry very much, but it is. Because it's inflammation that causes the healing response, and the healing response is t tissue regrowth. Now, you're getting extra tissue regrowth in muscle because it wants to adapt to whatever it was that you caused in the first place. So what your question actually gets to, and this is really fascinating, <clears throat> conventional medicine barely even understands chronic inflammation. It wasn't up until recently, well, Conventional medicine, conventional science knows about acute inflammation, and it's, it's very straightforward, redness, heat, pain, all these different things. But then there's this chronic inflammation that they're like, well, what the fuck is this? Like, it's, it's, it is inflammation. All we know is acute, so what the hell is this chronic inflammation? So in exercise, here's the problem when it comes to muscle building, I think, is if muscle growth is caused by inflammation, then why does this chronic inflammation that you're talking about cause you know a harder time to lose muscle? And instead of calling it uh, chronic inflammation, I'm going to call it sustained inflammation, because if you do ex if you exercise today, if you work out, you're going to cause a little bit of inflammation, and then you're going to give that body part a little chance to heal, repair itself, because it was inflammation in the first place. But this constant low-grade sustained inflammation never allows the muscle cell to essentially uh, to, to repair, if that makes sense. So it's sustained inflammation. Even though inflammation is what causes muscle growth, it also will inhibit it. But it's if it's if it's specific uh, bouts of inflammation followed by a period of time that can heal and the right nutrients to do so, then you get muscle growth. If it's sustained inflammation, which you could say is overtraining. If somebody, like let's say you're a bodybuilder and you do legs every day for the next 14 days, how much growth are you really going to get? Because that was sustained inflammation. So the number one thing that I see causing sustained inflammation and therefore lack of muscle growth is uh, react oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, uh, lipid peroxidation, which is all the exact same thing, just said in a slightly different way. But there's not there's not enough antioxidants in order to combat this oxidative stress, causing this sustained inflammation, uh, sustained eicosanoid production, for example, and this, this inflammatory cascade. I think you know this, but when you exercise, you, know, you increase interleukin-6, which is supposedly inflammatory. So we're caused, we're, muscle growth is caused by acute inflammation. It's sustained inflammation that will, will block it from happening. It's really interesting stuff. And did you know... <clears throat> What I wanted to do with by, by asking you this question was to open people's eyes to the importance of not just eating well. You know, I also think that training uh, frequency and training volume requires uh, an extra requirement for more nutrients because of you becoming very deficient. So, you know, it's all good and well training a lot and eating a healthy diet, but it's also training. Um, and uh, eating a diet specific to the amount of damage that you're causing with the body. So therefore, you know, that's why in performance training in bodybuilding, it's required to take supplements because we are using a lot more than we would do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Sure. So, um, you know, the digestive system is going to be under a lot more hammer with more food. The need for more antioxidants, vitamin C, um, obviously vitamin D3 is being deficient, magnesium deficiency. So we've got people who eat healthy, but then they could eat, actually eat not enough and have poor digestion, which is then for delaying this recovery process and prolonging this inflammation in the body, which therefore will then therefore damage the ability to grow and develop. So, you know, um, we're coming down to this whether it's a day-to-day -day person, whether or not it's a coach, whether or not it's a it's a bodybuilder, physique athlete, fitness athlete, we're in a world now where fewer and fewer people have a good understanding of physiology, even at a basic level. Um, fewer and fewer people have an appreciation and understanding globally of the way that cells, which is your passion, 
uh, hormones and health interact and are responsible for a lot of the problems that we face on a day-to-day -day basis physiologically and health-wise, you know? Um, so I really think that this podcast is going to hopefully really, really broaden people's understanding and um, uh, appreciation for the way that the body functions. And there is a, there is a bigger, bigger um, way that people should be thinking or at least approaching health um, and I can only thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending more time with me and sharing your vast amount of experience and knowledge with our listeners. Um, and it's, it's always a, a huge pleasure to spend time talking to you. What I would like to do is give you, please, an opportunity to tell people more about the online programs that you have. Because I'll tell you this right now. I'm about to fly to America. And I told you this before we came onto the podcast. I always watch one of your videos when I when I fly. Um, yes. And I told you, I told you, I'm going to look, I'm going to watch the liver liver one again, um, just because there's a situation that's come across recently with one of my clients where I like to just watch one of uh, Brian's videos. And the reason why I watch Brian's videos is because there's no one I know that stands in front of a whiteboard and explains where I can watch him going through the systems of the body and it reminds me of, I, see, I, I think a lot of trainers struggle to be able to articulate and explain to their clients in a very, very easy to understand way what might be going wrong. So trainers, you know, if they're explaining to somebody that they might need, might need magnesium or if they suspect that there's something wrong with the liver, trainers struggle to explain. And one of the things about your educational products is that you give us a way of being able to explain things and you explain it to us very, very well. So what are your products? Where do people go to find them? And what are they? Yeah, so I was going to say, if you like those videos, then I got some good ones coming up for you sometime in the near future. Um, the original one is, is Fat Is Not Your Fault. Um, that's the, the first product I came out with. Um, I, I continue to hear good stuff about it, I have to be honest. I mean, you just said you still watch those videos. <clears throat> uh, you know Owen Lacey. Um, he, he just uh, sent me an email a couple weeks ago. He, same thing. He's just like, this, this stuff is so freaking good. And, you know, it, it's, it's humbling. I'm, I'm glad it's helping people out. So uh, it's fatisnotyourfault.com. Um, you could probably speak more to that than I can. It's, uh, I did that a few years ago. Uh, more recently, though, and what I'm working on now is called uh, Metabolic Fitness. <clears throat> the website is metabolicfitnesspro.com. It's metabolicfitnesspro.com. Um, and that is going to be uh, four levels of just an insane amount of information. In fact, I, I can't even believe how much time it's taking me to do this. But the first level is nutritional biochemistry. I go in-depth into the different biochemical pathways. Um, so far, the feedback has been awesome on that one. Level two, since you're speaking of physiology, I'm going to take what I did in Fat Is Not Your Fault and take it to the next level. So um, whatever I talked about in Fat Is Not Your Fault about the liver, I'm going to take it even deeper. I'm going to go into liver pathways that, that I didn't even approach in Fat Is Not Your Fault. Uh, but I'm going to do that with all the different systems of the body. So um, that's a, that is metabolic fitness, I will say, is the, is the course that I wish I had when I was first getting started. Because it's going to take people through biochemistry, through physiology, functional physiology, blood chemistry interpretation, and then advanced laboratory interpretation. And honestly, I, I'm constantly thinking of new videos that I can make, so I don't know. It's probably going to go further than that. Um, you, need to, you, need to that I, you need to launch it before your brain keeps going. You need to stop your brain for a minute. Oh, dude, no. I was, you, you meant, I was up till 2 o'clock last night reading about uh, en endoplasmic reticulum stress. It was, was, was 2 o'clock. <laughs> I, I locked myself into the closet so my computer didn't wake up the rest of my family with its brightness when everybody was sleeping. But not two in the morning. I could not get enough of this. And then finally I was like, fuck, I got to go to bed. My kids are going to wake me up at like 5.30, so I got I to gotta go to bed. But I was like, I can do videos on this. This is like fascinating. It's, people need to know this. So, But metabolic fitness, fat is not your fault. It's cool. I, I, I liked it. You know, it's good info, I guess. Uh, but metabolic fitness, when that gets done, is going to be awesome. The, the first level is available now. Uh, at metabolicfitnesspro.com. So, excellent. Well, I'll just I'm going to back that up a little bit and uh, blow a bit more smoke up your ass if I may. Um, sure. Fat is not your fault. When I first came about it, was uh, it was a key to a puzzle which I really really needed as a coach because, you know, we're taught in the fitness industry about basic nutrition. We're taught taught in the in the fitness industry about training, 
and then about kicking people's asses. And, and, and it's such, you know, I'm, I'm proud to have been in the industry as long as I, sh as long as I have. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have met the people like yourself along the way. But one thing that, you know, in the early days of being a personal trainer that I wasn't ever opened to, my, 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 my eyes were never open to, was physiology and cells and hormones. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of trainers coming into the industry nowadays who are, um, you know, desperate to be body composition coaches. And they're coming into the industry straight away saying, just because they've got themselves lean for a photo shoot, that they're a body composition coach. A body composition coach is not somebody that can kick someone's ass in a gym. Anyone can get anyone lean. But if you get somebody lean with a physique and healthy, that's a skill, in my oh, opinion. Totally different, sure. Completely. So, you know, we talked about this at length with a physique coach that I was talking to the other day. You know, you can batter the hell out of somebody and have them with a six pack that's shredded. But ultimately what we're looking for is a physique at the end of it. Now, a physique doesn't mean lean. A physique means you had an ability to build muscle tissue, get somebody lean, done it in the healthiest way possible with the appreciation for physiology, hormones, and health. That's my interpretation of what, body yeah, composition yeah. body composition coaching. So this, um, when, when you are as a trainer out there and you're watching this and you're thinking, holy shit, this is a lot of information and it's, it's blown my mind, go on Fat Is Not Your Fault as the foundational introduction to Brian's work. Sit at home, as I did for hours on end, watching these videos. And each video will talk about um, the adrenals, the liver. Uh, they'll talk about uh, hormones in general. You do a stress one, right? That's four. What's the fifth? Yeah. Yeah. What's the fifth? Liver? Oh, I forgot the order. No, there's, there's uh, neurotransmitters. There's the mind-body connection. Yes. There's gut, there's the, the liver, yeah, yeah there's exactly. the so, so what happens is you, for a, as a trainer is you're going through these and you're like, oh my God, you know, I've got clients with this problem and that problem, maybe I didn't need to kick their ass as much, maybe if I just had a little bit of a better thought process and associated myself with a professional who knows more than I do right now because there are a lot of people in the fitness industry who still try and fix people and that's not their, that's out of their scope of practice and I, for one, um, as you know, Brian, I, I, I'm hugely, a huge fan of um, working alongside professionals that know more than me because I just want to get, I just want to get good at what I do, and that's getting people lean. And if I can't get somebody lean, I'm going to refer them to somebody who can work alongside me. So yep. use fat is not your fault as a tool to becoming more knowledgeable and more versed in these fields, not as a field where you feel like you can diagnose, prescribe, and fix people. Um, so again, it's a tool, but it's it, honestly, Brian, it's, it's one of the most wonderful tools in my toolbox, and I refer to it and refer to many trainers to go and buy it. Um, and I, I urge any of you watching this right now to to go on fatisnotyourfault.com and uh, get this video series. So, well, that's a phenomenal conversation we've had, and I've opened, I hope it's opened a lot of people's eyes to um, to this wonderful field, and also a one to a wonderful map. Um, who has had a huge influence in my industry career so far. So, Brian, thank you for sharing your morning with me um, and help educate and inspire the rest of the world with what you know. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Thank it you. Nice talking to you, Mike. Thank you, mate.